from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering VMworld 2018. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem partners. Welcome back to theCUBE, I'm Lisa Martin with Dave Vellante, John Furrier, Stu Miniman. At the end of day two of our continuing coverage, guys, of VMworld 2018, huge event, 25 plus thousand people here. Uh, 100,000 plus expected to be engaging with the on-demand and the live experiences. Our biggest show, right? 94 interviews over the next three days, two of them down. Let's go, John, to you. Some of the takeaways from today, from the guests we've had on both sets, what are some of the things that stick out in your mind just really? Well, we had Michael Dell on. That was always a great interview. He comes on every year and he's very candid. And this year he added a little bit more color commentary. So that was great, it was one of my highlights. I thought the keynote that Sanjay Putin did, he had an amazing guest, you know, Nobel Peace Prize winner, the youngest ever. Her story was so inspirational. Um, and I think that, that sets the tone for VMware putting a cultural stake in the ground around you know, tech for good. You know, we've done a lot of AI for good with Intel and there's always been these initiatives, but I think there's now a, a cultural validation that people generally want to work for and buy from companies that are mission driven, and mission driven is now part of it, and people can be judged on that, on that front. So it's good to see VMware get some leadership there and put the stake in there. I thought that was the, the big news today, at least from my standpoint. The rest were like point product announcements, Sanjay Putin went into great detail on that. Pat Gelsinger also came on, another great highlight. And again, we didn't have a lot of time, he's running a little bit late, he had a tight schedule, but it shows how smart he is. He's really super technical, and he actually understands at a root level what's going on. So he's actually a great CEO right now. The financial performance is there, and he's also very technical. And I think it encapsulates all of it. The Dell Technologies under Michael Dell, he's making so much more money, he's going to be richer <laughs> and richer. He took an entrepreneurial bet it wasn't hurting at the time, but you know, Dell was kind of boring, Dave. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it like an innovative company at the time when, when they were public using the 90-day shot clock. They had some things going on, but they were a hardware company, a supplier to IT footprints. Well, and, they were $60 billion in revenue and a $20 billion market cap, so something was broken. Well, I mean, it was working numbers-wise, but he seemed... No, to, that's the opposite. A $20 billion value on a $60 billion of revenue is you know, sort of a failure. Uh, so anyway, I mean, well he got there at well, the time. Market conditions aside, right, at the time, he seemed like he wanted to do something entrepreneurial. And the takeaway from my interview with him, our interview with him, was he took an entrepreneurial bet, put his own cash on the table, and it's paying off. That horse is coming in. He's going to make Huge. more money on this transaction and takes EMC out of the game, folds it into the operations. It really is going to be, I think, a financial success story. If market conditions continue to be the way they are, Michael Dell will go down as a great financial maneuver and he'll be in the top echelon of, of deals. The story people might forget is that Carl Icahn tried to take the company away from him. Michael Dell beat the great Carl Icahn, which doesn't happen often. Why did Carl Icahn want to take Dell private? Because he knew we could make a boatload of money off of it. And Michael Dell said, no way you're taking my company. I'm going to do my thing and change the industry. He's going to have 90% voting control with Silver Lake Partners when the deal's all said and done. And taking a company private and then executing the financial engineering plus execution is really hard to do. Look at Elon Musk in the news today. He's trying to take Tesla pub private. He got his butt handed to him. Now he's saying, no, we're going to stay public. Wait, wait, and, and guys, are you saying Michael's, after he gets all this money from VMware that it will help them go public, he's not going to sell off VMware or get rid of that, right? Well, wow, that's a joke that he would sell <laughs> VMware. I mean, Unless he, the cash is going to be good. No, I mean, he won't do it. <laughs> I don't think it'll happen. I mean, you know, maybe someday he, he, he sells some of the portion of it, but he's not going to give up control of it. Why would he? It's throwing off so much cash. He's well, got Silver Lake as the private equity company. They understand this inside and out. I mean, this, this transaction, is, it goes down in history as one of the greatest trades ever. Yeah, we were talking about. Well, let me ask you guys a question because I think this is one we brought up in the interview. Because at that time, the pundits, we we were actually right on this uh, that deal. We were very bullish on it, and we actually analyzed it. You guys did a good job at Wikibon, and we in the cube pretty much laid out what happened. He executed it. We put the risks out there, but at the time, people were saying this is a bad deal. EMC, the current state of IT at that time, looked like it was dismal. But the market forces that changed were cloud, and so. What were those sideways impact points that no one understood? That really helped him lift this up. What's your thoughts, Dave, Well, so the, 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 first of all, the desktop business did way better than anybody thought it would, which is amazing. And actually, EMC did pretty poorly for a while. And so that was kind of a head fake. And then, as we knew, VMware 
crushed it and, and crushed it even more than anybody expected. So that threw off so much cash, they were able to delever. They did, they did pivotal, they did a pivotal IPO, sold some software assets. I mean, it, basically, Michael Dell and his team did everything they said they were going to do, and it's worked out, as he said today, even better than they possibly thought. Well, and the, the commentary I'd give here is when the acquisition of EMC by Dell happened, the big concern we had is the impact of cloud. And we said, well, okay, they got VMware over there and they've got Pivotal, but you know, Dell's just going to be a boring infrastructure company with you know, server network and storage. The message that we heard at Dell World and maturing even more here is that this portfolio of families. Yes, VMware's a big piece of it. NSX and in the, in the networking, but Pivotal with PKS, all of those tie into what Dell's selling. Every time they're selling VxRail, you know, that has a big VMware piece. As they, they do the networking piece that extends across multi-cloud, so Dell has a much better multi-cloud story than I expected them to have when they bought EMC. But now, VMware hides a lot of warts. Yeah. Right, let's, let's, Absolutely. let's, let's, let's be honest they? about that. Okay, well, so, I just still think the client business is exposed. I mean, as, 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 as great as it is, you got to gain share in that business if you want to keep winning, number one. Number two is, the big question I have is, can the core of Dell EMC continue to innovate, or will it just make incremental improvements, have to do acquisitions to do innovation, inorganic acquisitions, and end up with more stovepipes? That's always been, Stu used to work there, that was always EMC's biggest challenge. Jeff Clark came in and said, okay, we're going to rationalize the portfolio. That has backlash as customers say, well, wait a minute, does that mean you're not going to support my products? No, no, we're going to support your products. So they've got to continue to innovate. As they say, VMware, because of how much cash it throws, it's 50% of the company's profits, hides a lot of those exposures. And if VMware takes a turn, if market conditions change, the debt looming is exposed. So again, the game's not over, Dell. We see, he can see the finish line, but. <laughs> Buy low, sell high. Guess who's selling right now? <laughs> so a lot of financial impact, continued innovation, but at the end of the day, guys, this is all about impacting customers' businesses. Not just from, we've got to enable them to be successful in this multi-cloud era, that's the norm today. They need to facilitate successful digital transformations, business outcomes, but they also have VMware, Dell EMC, Dell Technologies, great power to help customers transform their cultures. I'd love to get perspectives from you guys because I love the voice of the customer. What are some of your favorite Dell EMC, VMware, uh, partner, customer stories that you've heard the last couple of days that really articulate the value of this financial successful company that they're achieving. Well, the first thing I'll say before we get into the customer stories is on your point about what, what VMware's doing is, they're a technology company. Robin Matlock, the CMO, was on theCUBE talking about they're a technology company. They have the hands-on labs, they're a very geeky audience, which we love, but they have to get leadership on the product side. They got to maintain the R&D, they got to have best, of, best in class technical products that actually are relevant. You look at um, companies like Tintree that, are, that went bankrupt. Great technology, cul-de-sac market. There's no market there, the world's going cloud. So to me, VMware has to start pumping out really strong products and technologies that the customers are going to buy. Right? In conjunction so, with the customer to help yes. co-develop what the customers need. So, I was talking to a customer and he said, look, I'm 10 years behind where the cloud guys are with Amazon, so all I want is VMware to make my life easier, continue to cut my costs. I like the way I've, I'm, I'm operating. I just, I get constant pressure to cut costs. So if they keep doing that, yeah. I'm going to stay with them for a long, long time. Keith Townsend said it best. Companies like VMware, Dell EMC, they move at the speed of the CIO. And as long as they can move at the speed of the CIO, I've said this a million times, the rich gets, get richer. And, and it's why competent management that led by founders like Larry Ellison, like Michael Dell, continue to do well in this industry. Yeah. And Andy Jassy technically is, what I'd say, a yeah, founder of a, AWS because right. he started it, that's key. The other thing I would also say from a customer, we hear a lot of customer, I won't name names because a lot of our data is in the hallway conversations uh, and at night when we go out and get the real stories. On theCUBE it's mostly, oh, we've been very successful at VM, we use virtualization, blah, 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 and it's, it's an IT story. But the customers in the hallways that are, that are off the record are saying essentially this, I'm paraphrasing, Look, we have an operation to run. I love this cloud stuff, and I'd love to just blink my fingers and be in the cloud and just get rid of all this stuff and operate at a level of cloud native. I just can't, I can't get there. So they see Amazon's relationship with VMware as a bridge to the future and takes away a lot of cognitive dissonance around their feelings around VMware's 
lack of cloud, if you will. In this case now, that's satisfied with the AWS deal, and they're focused on operations on premise, premises and how to get their app more clothes, like modernized. So a lot of the blocking and tackling of the customer is I got virtualization and that's great, but I don't want to miss out on the next lever of innovation. Okay, I'm looking at it going slow, but no one's instantly migrating no to the cloud. No <laughs> way. They, you're yeah. either born in the cloud or you're on migration schedules now, really evaluating the financial impact, economic impact, headcount impact of cloud. That's the reality of the you, cloud. You got to flow, throw a flag on some of that messaging of how easy it is to migrate. I mean, it's just not that easy. You know, I've, I've talked to customers that we said, well, we started and we just kind of gave up. There was no point in it. The new stuff we're going to do in the cloud, but we're not going to migrate all of our apps to the cloud. It just makes no sense. There's no business case for it. And this is where NSX and containers and Kubernetes bet is big, I think. I think yeah. if NSX can connect the clouds with some, some sort of interoperable layer for the, whatever workloads are going to move on either Amazon or the clouds, that's good. If they want to get the developers off virtualization into a new drug, if you will, it's going to be services, services, microservices, Kubernetes, because you can throw containers around those old workloads, modernize with the new, new stuff without killing the old. And we, Stu and I heard this clear at the CNCF and the Linux Foundation, that this has changed the mindset because you don't have to kill the old to bring in the new. You can bring in the new, containerize the old, and manage on your, on your speed of the CIO. And that's, and that's Amazon's bet, isn't it? I mean, look, even Sanjay even said, if you go back five, six years, the original uh, reInvent, it was sweep the floor, bring it all into the cloud. I think that's in Amazon's DNA. I mean, ultimately, that's their vision. That's what they want to have happen. And the way they get there is how you well, just described it, John. And, and that's where this partnership between Amazon and VMware is so important, because right, Amazon has a lot of the developers but needs to be able to get deeper into the enterprise. And VMware, starting to make some progress with the developers. They've got a code initiative. They've got all these cool projects that they announced with everything yeah. from you know, serverless and Kubernetes and uh, you know, many others. Edge uh, going to be a key use case there. Uh, but you know, VMware is not, you know, this is yeah. not the developer show. Um, most of the conversations that I had with, with customers, it's, we're talking IT things. I mean, customers doing some cool things, but it's about simplifying in my environment. It's about helping operations. It's not, most of the conversations are not about this cool new microservices, yeah. uh, building these things out. I mean, Cisco I, really is the only legacy, tr you know, traditional enterprise company that's crushing developers. You give some IBM some chops too, but I wouldn't say they're crushing it. And we saw that at yeah. Cisco Live. Cisco is doing a phenomenal job with developers. Well the thing about the cloud, one thing I've been pointing out, observation that I have, is if you look at the future of the cloud, and you can look for you know, metaphors and, and or real examples, I think Amazon Web Services, obviously we know them well, but Google Cloud to me is a, is a picture of the future. Not in the sense of what they have for the, for the customer today, it's the way they've run their business from day one. They have developers and they have SRE, Site Reliability Engineers. This VM world community is going down to two paths. Developers are going to be rapidly iterating on, on real apps and operators who are going to be running systems. That's network, storage, all integrated. That's like an SRE at Google. Google's running massive scale and they perfected it. Hence Kubernetes, hence some of the tools coming into services like um, Istio, uh, and things that we're seeing in the Linux Foundation. So to me, that's the future model. It's an operator and develop, set of developers. Whoever can make that easy, completely seamless, and the is the winner pin, of it all. The, uh, a linchpin is, a linchpin, maybe not the linchpin, but a linchpin is still the database. Right, we, we've seen that with Oracle, you see it, you, why is Amazon going so hard after the database? I mean, it's blatantly obvious what the Database is, is the hill that everyone okay. is trying to take down. Capture okay. the hill, you got the high ground with the database. And that, that's a, hey, come on, that, Dave, that's a when big we, prize. When we used to do the financial models of how much money is spent by the enterprise, you know, that database was a big chunk. You know, we, we've seen uh, the erosion of lots of licensing out there. When I talk to Microsoft, they're like, you know, pushing a lot of open source, they're going to cloud, so Microsoft licensing isn't as much. VMware licensing is something that customers would like to shrink over time, but database is even bigger. It's a strategic fulcrum. Obviously, Oracle has it. Microsoft clearly has it with SQL Server. IBM, a big part of IBM's success to this day is DB2 running on mainframe. <laughs> it is. And so, Amazon wants a piece of that action. They understand to be a major player in this business, you have to have database infrastructure. I mean, costs are going down. It's going to come down to economics. At the end of the day, the operating models, as I said, some of the things about DB2 on mainframe, the bottom line is going to come down to when the cost numbers to run at the value and cost expense involved in running the tech, that's going to be the ultimate way things are either going to be cleared out 
or replace or expand it. So the bottom line is it's going to be a cost equation at that level and then the upside is going to be revenue. And just a great thing for VMware, since they don't own the application, when they do things like RDS in their environment, they are freeing up dollars that customers are then going to be more likely to want to uh, spend with VMware. Point. So I, I want to make real quick, three things we've, we've been watch, uh, watching this week. Is the Amazon VMware deal a one-way trip to the cloud? I think it's clear, not in the near term, anyway. Uh, and the second is, what about the edge? The edge, to me, all about data. It's like the wild, wild west. It's, it's very unclear that there's, there's a winner there, but there's a new type of cloud emerging. And three is the Dell structure. We asked Pat, uh, we asked uh, uh, v VMware Ray O'Farrell, we asked Michael if that $11 billion you know, special dividend was going to impact VMware's ability to fund its future. Consistent answer there, no. You know, we'll see. <laughs> We'll see. I mean, I mean, what are they going to say? Yeah, that really limits my ability to buy companies on theCUBE. No, that's the messaging. Hey, so, hey, of course, just, $11 just billion dollars gone means they can't do M&A with the cash. Yeah. That means, yeah, it's going to be, yeah, R&D. What does that mean, investment? So, hey. I think the answer is yes, it does limit them a little bit. Has to. It's cash But, but going VMware just spent, uh, it is rumored, around $500 million for cloud health technology. Dave, Boston-based company right. with about 200 people. So, you know, hey. Well, they're going to pay dividends. They're going to put back a dividend anyway and do stock buybacks, but, I'm not sure you know, 11 out of the 13 billion is what they would choose to do that for. So going forward, we'll see how it all plays out, obviously. I think, Floyer wrote about this, more has to go toward VMware. Less I think it's the other way around. Well, I think, think it's really mean? good that we I have the, one more day tomorrow. I think it's a one-way trip to the cloud in a lot of instances. I think a lot of VMware customers are going to go off virtualization, non-hypervisor, and end up being in the cloud most of the business. So it's going to be interesting, I think, the size of customers that's going to, the size of the customers Amazon has now versus VMware is what? So, does uh, VMware have more customers than Amazon right now? It's pretty close, right? Am, uh, VMware is no, 500,000 for VMware. And Amazon's over a million. Are they over a million, really? Yeah. yeah a lot so, of smaller customers, but still. Yeah, it's, uh, it's okay, I mean, customers are customers. Amazon, but, but, but VMware might have bigger customers. See, that's, it's a, No a, question the ASP is higher. It's not a I'm just thinking like, Cloud is natural, right? So like, why wouldn't you want to use the cloud, right? I mean. So guys. So the debate continues. Exactly. Good news is we have more time tomorrow to talk more about all this innovation, as well as see more real world examples of how VMware is going to be enabling tech for good. Guys, thanks so much for your commentary and Thank letting you. me be a part of the wrap. Thanks Lisa. Looking forward to day three tomorrow. For Dave, Stu, and John, I'm Lisa Martin. You've been watching our coverage of day two VMworld 2018. We look forward to you joining us tomorrow for day three.